Last week we started reading about the one who will become the father of Savitri. A world's desire compelled her mortal birth because of the great need of the world, which is embodied in this one particular individual, Savitri, was born. And Sri Aurobindo is describing that one, that person, that one in the front of the immemorial quest, the leader of the evolutionary search. But now, when we come to page, um, uh, to line 51, uh, Sri Aurobindo is not talking about that one, he's speaking about all of us. He says, hidden deep in man, celestial powers can dwell. So I'm going to read on about those, uh, that incognito, that disguised form of the imperishable who lives within each one of us. This sculptor of the forms of the infinite, this screened, unrecognized inhabitant, initiate of his own veiled mysteries, hides in a small dumb seed his cosmic thought. In the mute strength of the occult idea, determining predestined shape and act Passenger from life to life, from scale to scale, changing his imaged self from form to form, he regards the icon growing by his gaze, and in the worm foresees the coming God. At last, the traveler in the paths of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity in the transient symbol of humanity draped. He feels his substance of undying self and loses his kinship to mortality. A beam of the eternal smites his heart. His thought stretches into infinitude. All in him turns to spirit vastnesses. His soul breaks out to join the oversoul. His life is oceaned by that super life. He has drunk from the breasts of the mother of the worlds. A topless supernature fills his frame. She adopts his spirits everlasting ground as the security of her changing world and shapes the figure of her unborn mites. Immortally she conceives herself in him. In the creature the unveiled creatrix works. Her face is seen through his face. 
her eyes through his eyes. Her being is his through a vast identity. Then is revealed in man the overt divine, a static oneness and dynamic power descend in him, the integral Godhead's seals. His soul and body take that splendid stamp. I think we'll start this side today. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, would you read first, please? This sculpture was the form of the infinite. This green, unrecognized inhabitant, initiate of his own veiled mystery, hides in a small, dumb sea, his cosmic thought. Yes. In the, in the passage we le read last week, Sri Aurobindo said that there's a spirit, a spirit that is a flame, an energy of God, abides, lives, immortal in our mortal poverty. We are so poor and limited and small, but living within us, there is an immortal part. And that immortal part is an artist. He's a creative artist. And here in this sentence, Sri describes him as a sculptor. A sculptor is an artist who shapes three-dimensional forms. He's not a painter and he's not a poet. He makes three-dimensional forms. So, um, this artist who is dwelling within each individual form in the creation is a sculptor. And what he's sculpting, the forms that he is shaping, they are forms of the infinite, of the supreme. He's living in us. He's an inhabitant inhabiting each of the different forms of the creation. But he's screened, he's hidden, and so we don't recognize that he is there. Mm. That inhabitant dwelling within the human heart is the initiate of his own veiled mysteries. An initiate is somebody who knows the secrets of some hidden knowledge. Usually, to become an initiate, one has to go through a special discipline, be taught by a teacher. But this initiate uh, automatically knows those secrets. They are his own uh, veiled, hidden mysteries. The word mystery can also mean secret knowledge. So in the past there used to be schools for the mysteries, for certain kinds of secret knowledge. And to, you could uh, join that group and pass through many stages and become an initiate, learn all the secrets of those mysteries. This initiate, this one who knows all the secrets, 
is hiding in a small dumb seed his cosmic thought, his universal thought. The way I understand this is that in the transcendent state beyond the universe, in the eternal and the infinite, the one, the one contains within his infinity and eternity many, many infinite number of possibilities, of potentialities. And when he creates the world, creates the universe, and expresses himself in all the individual forms of the universe in time and space, in each of those forms he hides like a seed, a seed of one of his uh, uncountable uh, potentialities. So each of us is carrying within ourselves in a, as a small, dumb seed, hmm? a thought, a possibility, an idea of the Supreme. Hmm? Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be here at all. And now he's going to tell us a little bit more about that small dumb seed and how it grows in time and space. Rosa, will you read, please? Shalom, I have uh, one question about initiate and initiate. Uh, sorry, yes. Sylvia, you have a difference with initiate and lettre délié? Sorry? A difference between the initié and? And then être éveillé, when he's open of Well, with the idea of initiate, there yeah. goes the idea of knowledge. Yeah. That this being has acquired some knowledge which is not available to everybody, which is a kind of secret knowledge. Secret. Oh. Yeah? <clears throat> yes, please, Rosa. In the new state of the pop out idea, the predestined shape and death, a passenger from life to life, from scale, uh, scale to scale, changing. changing. So that small dumb seed which contains the cosmic thought of the Creator, that seed doesn't die. It puts on different forms. What he's doing in all the forms which he inhabits is that he's carrying out that original occult hidden idea that cosmic thought of the Creator. Hmm? And that's the strength, the silent, hidden strength that each of us is carrying within us. In the Sanskrit, we call it our svabhava, our self-existence. It's the cosmic thought that is in each one of us, which is in its origin, eternal and infinite. Hmm? So in the mute strength of that occult idea, 
this small dumb seed determines predestined shape and act. If you have a seed, a seed of a tree or a plant, that seed is containing within it certain possibilities. And if you plant the seed in the right ground and give it water and so on, it will express uh, certain shapes and um, do certain things. Those things are predestined. They've been coded into the seed from the very beginning. Nowadays we talk about genes. That the, it's the genes that determine uh, what color the flower is, what species it is, what color it is, uh, what kind of leaves it will grow, and what properties it will have. You know? So it is like that. We're carrying a seed within us. And according to the nature of the seed, then we put on different shapes and act differently. So this seed within us, this soul within us, is a passenger from life to life. The form of the seed changes, but the the actual seed, the divine seed inside, uh, that moves on and develops another suitable form. Hmm? It, it's a passenger, it travels from one life form to another. And from scale to scale, it starts out very, very small as a very tiny little, maybe a one-celled creature like an amoeba or something. But uh, gradually, as nature offers more possibilities, it can become more developed and grow bigger and have more potentialities. So it changes its imaged self from form to form. But all the time it's keeping within it that self, that imaged self, and that inhabitant is watching the different forms and shapes that it takes. He regards the icon growing by his gaze. An icon is a sacred picture, an image of the divine. And it's as if, as he looks at it, concentrates on it, that icon changes. It grows because of the concentration of that being upon it. And that being can see when he's only a worm, he's only living in the body of a worm, he can see all the future evolutionary possibilities that he's carrying within him, that he can become a divine being. I don't know whether that's understandable to you, but, but it's interesting that Sri Aurobindo says that the growth happens because the soul within us is watching and seeing that the development goes right. The icon is the témoin. Sorry? Icon. An icon, uh, no, in Russia, they have beautiful uh, sacred pictures of the Virgin and the Child or the Saints or whatever. So it's an image of the Divine. Uh, he doesn't say idol. An idol would be another word that could be used. But, uh, and that icon is not staying always the same. He's watching this image of the Divine developing and changing as uh, evolutionary nature allows it more possibilities. Thank you. Omid, would you like to read? Yeah, sure. At last, the traveler in the pass of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity. In the transient symbol 
of humanity draped. He feels his substance of undying self and loses his kinship to mortality. So what happens is with all these passages from life to life, from form to form, at last this traveler who's passing through time, a traveler in the paths of time, he reaches the frontiers of eternity. He develops until he's almost a god. No? He's wearing, he's covered up by this form of humanity, of a human being. But that's just a transient symbol. It's a symbolic form that will not last forever. It passes. Hmm? When he reaches that high stage of development, then he feels and experiences his substance of self, hmm? undying self, his immortal substance, hmm? the transient symbol of humanity is mortal, it will die, but he feels his substance of undying self. And when he has that experience, then he loses his kinship to mortality. He knows that he is really immortal and that relationship to his limited human form that is subject to death uh, gets separated. A being of the eternal's mind uh -huh. is the heart. This is thought stretches into the infinitude. All in him turns to the spirit, vastness, vastness. His soul breaks out to join the over soul. His life is ocean by that super life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there comes a moment when a great powerful ray of light from the eternal smites his heart, opens up the heart, mm -hmm. and then uh, the mind also opens up, his thought stretches into infinitude. Everything in him, it comes about a transformation. Everything in him turns to spirit vastnesses, to the unlimited quality of the spirit. And then the little individual soul in him will read about how it happens uh, later on in the poem. It breaks out of this limited individuality and unites with the oversoul, the one soul of everything. And then his whole life changes. His life also becomes as vast as an ocean. His life is oceaned by that super life that is not the life of our limited consciousness it's the life of the spirit but Shadavana will tell you something but when the knock of mind so. knock, knock of mind broken hmm. at this moment you, you go on the level yes. yes that's one of the the crucial experiences, yeah. huh? no, it's being freed from the triple cord of mind. Yeah. That's what they speak about in the Vedas. Yeah, yeah. Huh? In Savitri. Uh, it in also Savitri. comes in Savitri, yeah. yes, but it's a Vedic very, idea very, 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 very that we are tied like an animal yeah. to the stake of sacrifice by this triple cord of mind, body, life and this limited mind that we have. When Mother picked me up, hmm? automatically some scene like comes in there. It's very, very, very effective. 
healed with yes. He has drank from the breast of the mother of the world. A topless supernatural fills his frame. She adapts spirits everlasting from as the security of our changing worlds and shapes the figure of her unborn minds. Yes. So all this happens because he's been nourished all this time by the mother of the worlds. The mother who has given birth to all these worlds and forms. And so he f his frame, his uh, whatever is the frame of his individuality is filled with a topless supernature, a supernature that uh, has no upper limit, a va great vastness. She, that's the mother of the worlds, she adopts, she takes over this everlasting ground, this basis of his spirit as the foundation the security of her changing world. She will use his spirit and his nature and his possibilities to, um, as a basis for her creative acts. On that basis, she will shape the figure, all the different forms and images of her unborn mites, all the powers that she hasn't given birth to yet, that have not yet been manifested, all kinds of new possibilities in the universe. Chandra. Yes. So when this moment of fulfilled development comes, you know, it's as if the mother of the world takes hold of that individual and in him she fulfills her some of her immortal ideas. He's her creation, he's a creature and the creatrix works in her creature, in and through him. Creatrix is the feminine form of the word creator. So then, in that individual, we can get a glimpse of the Supreme Divine Mother. Her face is seen through his face. Her eyes through his eyes. She and he, they become one through a vast identity. They become united. When that happens, in the human being, the overt divine is revealed. The divine is hidden within all of us, but we don't see him. He's that hidden, unrecognized inhabitant. But when that moment of fulfillment is reached, then we can see the divine openly expressed in that individual being. Suresh. Take the 
Mm. So there's, there are signs of that change, of that transformation. And it's, they have two sides. One is the static oneness, the unchanging, eternal, infinite oneness becomes his consciousness and nature. And along with that is the dynamic power, the unlimited dynamic power of the one. These things come and act in the individual. And these things are like seals or stamps of the integral Godhead, of the complete divinization. Not just consciousness, not just power, both together. And his soul and his body take that splendid stamp. That's when the individual becomes a divine being and lives a divine life. Sergei. The law of deep liberation in man's life, a sort of soul, soul and hope and love and peace, great heart by life, no matter of sin or So, we are going through this long, dim preparation. Not much light in it. Hmm. And we go circling round and round toiling, struggling, working hard, hoping, suffering, war and peace. This is the track that life marks out for us on this obscure ground of unconscious matter. But all this is a long, dim preparation in us uh, the soul is growing, the individual is growing, the seed is growing. Lela. In his own dirty mercy, however, drop, he sees through a younger shop to claim a very dirty half known. A search for something for someone never found. Cold behind the year never made the year here. An endless spiral of ascent and fall until at last we reach the giant point through which his glory shines full. Yes. So this is what is happening for all of us. We are climbing towards a very, very high peak of existence that no feet have trodden it yet. Or perhaps when you get there, you don't have feet anymore. And the individual is seeking through this penumbra, this twilight, this half darkness, which is lit up sometimes by flashes of flame, of aspiration, of uh, hope, of energy. Through that, on that journey, what each one of us is seeking is a reality, our own true self which is veiled, hidden. Hmm? We only half know it, maybe not even half. Hmm? And yet something in us is always missing that true self that we have to become. We are searching for something or someone that we have never found. And within us, 
It's as if there's a kind of worship of an ideal that has never yet been made real here, an achievement that has not yet happened in the earth manifestation. So that journey, this climb, it's an endless spiral. It goes on and on and on, round and round in circles, and sometimes we have to go down in order to go up. An endless spiral of ascent and fall until at last is reached the giant point. Usually a point is without dimensions, but this is a, a giant point, no? And through that giant point is shining the glory, the glory of the one for whom we were made. We've been created to express that one. Hmm? There's a beautiful saying of uh, the Christian saint Augustine, a very sensitive seeker and thinker. And he has a prayer, he says, Oh Lord, we were made, you made us for yourself, and we can never rest until we find ourselves in you. Mm -hmm. It's like that. We reach that giant point and then we recognize, oh, this is it. This is what I was always looking for. And then we break out of all our human limitations into the infinity of God. You read? I don't know your name. Devane. Devane? Across our nature's border line we escape into supernature's arc of living light. This now was witnessed in that sun of force. In him that high transition lay in space. Yes. So there's that moment of reaching the giant point and breaking out of all the limits. And then we escape across all these borderlines of our nature into supernature's arc. An arc is part of a circumference of a circle, but it's not complete, it's not limiting. Supernature's arc of living light. So this process now and this realization was witnessed, was seen in that sun of force, that one that uh, Shobindo is talking about, who will become the father of Savitri. His name is Asvapati. In him, in King Asvapati, that high transition, that passage from one state to another one, laid its base, its beginning. Ganga Lakshmi? Process. To heaven use. Yes. So he's speaking about the cosmic worker, the one who is at work in the universe. He says that worker is the original and supernal, supreme immanence. Immanence means dwelling within, the inhabitant, the, the one who's dwelling within 
all of this. That immanence, who is the artist who's working through all nature's processes. Hmm? That cosmic worker now secretly starts to work on this particular individual, the physical aspect, this <coughs> individual, this frail mud engine. <coughs> Sorry. Our bodies are frail mud engines. They can easily be broken. They are made of matter. They work like machines. So that immanence, that cosmic worker has picked out this particular mud engine. He's going to make it do his work. Please, you read. So there's a presence, the presence of that immanence is working, this word wrought, you know we talk about wrought iron, it's iron that is shaped into complicated shapes. So there's a presence working behind the ambiguous screen, the screen of appearances which uh, we find difficult to interpret and understand. That presence is beating Aswapati's soil, his, the substance of his being, so that it is able to bear the weight of something superhuman, titan. Sometimes Shobindo uses this word titan in a, a, a pejorative sense, something undesirable. But here it means something huge, superhuman, very, very strong. So that presence is taking half-hewn blocks of natural strength, as if in his nature there are, um, it's made out of rock, blocks of rock, which have been half cut. They're not perfectly shaped. The sculptor will go to the quarry and find a block of stone, maybe very rough in shape, but he will see some possibility in that uh, block and say, that one, I want that one. And then he will take it and work on it. So this presence of the power from behind is refining those half-hewn blocks of natural strength in Aswapati's nature to build his soul into a statued god, a divine being in a, in a permanent, uh, strong form. Mochi, you'll, you'll read. Craftsman of the magic stuff of self, who labors at his high and of one in the bright workshop of the wonderful world, more than in what times it may cross. Mm, so this is how that sculptor is working. He doesn't work with material things. He works with the magic stuff of self the subtle being. He is always working at his high and difficult plan in the wide workshop 
of the wonderful world. All this wonderful world is his workshop and he's got so many projects going. But in this Aspapati project, in inward time, inner time, not the outer time, he's modeling, shaping the rhythmic, beautiful, harmonious, rhythmic shapes of uh, the parts of Aswapati's nature. Sarojini. So then something suddenly happens. He's been working away behind the screen in inward time, but then suddenly, abrupt, it happens very unexpectedly and suddenly this miracle, this transcendent miracle, that hidden greatness which is doing all this shaping, this immaculate grandeur, which is absolutely pure and perfect, is able to make an outline in life. He's giving birth to something at travail. It is the idea of giving birth to a child. So in the womb of life, life is the womb which will have to give birth to this new child. And he's able to outline his dreamed magnificence of things to be, things that will be in the future. He creates this very special being, King Asvapati. Alice. The crown of the architecture of the worlds, a mystery of married earth and heaven, annexed divinity to the moral scheme. The seer was born, a shining guest of time. So this is what happens. A special being, a very special human being. He's a crown of the architecture of the world, so all the many different forms that have been uh, shaped. This being, he's something mysterious because it's a marriage of earth and heaven, the material world and the higher levels of consciousness. And this makes a connection, a next divinity. If you uh, sometimes it happens that a country annexes a neighboring country. I think in the 1970s, India annexed um, Sikkim. No? That small little country, India just took it into its, its power. So if we see it the other way round, that here what happens is that the divinity becomes part of the mortal scheme. to the scheme here which is not immortal, which is in the grip of earth, of uh, ignorance and death, the material scheme. As a result, this special being 
is born. I mean, he was born before, he was already in existence, but he becomes a seer, a rishi, one who can know the truth, a shining guest of time, an immortal being living here in the human world. Is this the, um, the abrupt descent? This is the abrupt transcendent miracle, yes. And now he will tell us a little bit more about that. Slava. For him, minds leading frequent seeing law. In the briefing for front of the night and day, he was burned in the whole concealing world. The conscious ends of being went from the way. Island, island. The bison ego during this Yes. So for him, for Aspapati, this seer, the shining guests of time, this limiting firmament, this kind of sky, this lid, sky lid ceases, it no longer exists. He says, in the griffin forefront of the night and day, this, on the very edge or limit or frontier of this world of dualities, of contradictions, of light and dark and all the other opposites, something is opened up, a gap is rent. Whatever was limiting is split and opened in that all-concealing vault. A vault is a curved roof like we have in our hall over there. It just opens up. You know? And for Asvapati, all the conscious ends, the frontiers and limitations of his being just get ro rolling back like um, scenery in a theater being moved away and uh, there's no limitations anymore. No? The landmarks, all the, um, the border lines, the, the things that mark the border lines of the little person, of the little human person, they just fall and this separate individual, this island ego, joins its continent. It's not an island anymore. It's part of a vast self. We'll stop there for today. When the island is revealed, the island. When the island they go or from we join this continent. It's for each of us. Each of us is like an island, no? Yeah. But the poet tells us no man is an island. Actually, we we're all part of that continent. But our consciousness is developed like that. And in the Life Divine, Sri tells us why it is like that. In order to develop our individuality, we have to go through this ego phase. But then we can develop more and more and come to this giant point where the, the ends of being go rolling back and the island ego joins its continent becomes part of its own true, vaster whole. Uh, Shadavana, I have a question. What is the base, eternal base? So, sorry? 
eternal base. Not, not this that I read in Savitri. The go base. Back, yeah, go back hmm? to the la base. Yes. Eternal base. There's something which is holding all this up, no? <laughs> we may feel as if we are floating in space, but we are not. We wouldn't be here at all unless there were an eternal base which is allowing all this to exist. No, no, it's not for me, but it's difficult to understand when I read. Yes, these are very challenging, mysterious lines. I have written this book, no, the English of Savitri, uh, volume one. It covers all these lines. But now as I read them with you again, I think, how could I ever have explained that? <laughs> Uh, my teacher, Amal Kiran, who had so much correspondence with Sri Aurobindo about this poem, he told me once, I regret it so much. Why did I never ask him about this line in the griffin forefront of the night and day? Why does he use that word griffin here? Hmm? Do you know what a griffin is? Hmm? It's a, it's a figure in ancient Greek uh, iconography, actually. It looks like a lion, but it has the beak of a big bird and bird's wings. And uh, they used it a lot in their temples. There would be griffins holding things up. So the only light I could um, find about this is that the griffin is the, uh, are the, the griffins. There's this um, goddess of necessity who determines how things have to be. Mm -hmm. And her chariot is driven, is pulled by griffins. So perhaps that gives some idea about <laughs> coming to the end of that world which is determined by necessity. There's a gap that's rent in this uh, world of night and day open up to something much, much vaster. And it's, it's a, this, these symbolic animals, they always have a meaning. Um, so the lion, it's the most powerful animal on the earth. No? And this griffin, this great vulture or eagle, that's perhaps the most powerful bird in the sky. So this being moves freely, not only on the earth, but in, in the higher levels of consciousness. This sculptor of the forms of the infinite, this screened, unrecognized inhabitant, initiate of his own veiled mysteries, hides in a small, dumb seed his cosmic thought. In the mute strength of the occult idea, determining predestined shape and act, passenger from life to life, from scale to scale, changing his imaged self from form to form, he regards the icon growing by his gaze, and in the worm 
foresees the coming God. At last, the traveller in the paths of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity. In the transient symbol of humanity draped, he feels his substance of undying self and loses his kinship to mortality. A beam of the eternal smites his heart. His thought stretches into infinitude. All in him turns to spirit vastnesses. His soul breaks out to join the over-soul. His life is ocean by that super life. He has drunk from the breasts of the mother of the worlds. A topless super nature fills his frame. She adopts his spirit's everlasting ground as the security of her changing world and shapes the figure of her unborn minds. Immortally she conceives herself in him, in the creature, the unveiled creatrix works. Her face is seen through his face, her eyes through his eyes, her being is his through a vast identity. Then is revealed in man the overt divine. A static oneness and dynamic power descend in him. The integral Godhead seals. His soul and body take that splendid stamp. A long, dim preparation is man's life. A circle of toil and hope and war and peace tracked out by life on matter's obscure ground. In his climb to a peak no feet have ever trod. He seeks through a penumbra shot with flame, a veiled reality, half known, ever missed, a search for something or someone never found. Cult of an ideal never made real here, an endless spiral of ascent and fall, until at last is reached the giant point through which his glory shines for whom we were made, and we break into the infinity of God. Across our nature's borderline we escape 
into supernature's arc of living light. This now was witnessed in that sun of force. In him that high transition laid its base. Original and supernal immanence, of which all nature's process is the art, the cosmic worker set his secret hand to turn this frail mud engine to heaven use. A presence wrought behind the ambiguous screen. It beat his soil to bear a titan's weight. Refining half-hewn blocks of natural strength it built his soul into a statued god the craftsman of the magic stuff of self who labors at his high and difficult plan in the wide workshop of the wonderful world, modelled in inward time his rhythmic parts. Then came the abrupt transcendent miracle, the masked immaculate grandeur could outline at travail in the occult womb of life his dreamed magnificence of things to be. A crown of the architecture of the worlds, a mystery of married earth and heaven, annexed divinity to the mortal scheme. A seer was born, a shining guest of time. For him, mind's limiting firmament ceased above. In the griffin forefront of the night and day, a gap was rent in the all-concealing vault. The conscious ends of being went rolling back, the landmarks of the little person fell. The island ego joined its continent.